Welcome to another edition of Grace Under Pressure, where my guest today is Fritz Seiferth. I will tell you all about Fritz in just a minute. Uh, first of all, Grace Under Pressure is that show that focuses on what's too often dismissed as the soft stuff, the caring, the commitment we exert toward others. Um, but when you do it as a leader, as you will definitely discover that Fritz is, um, you do it with the purpose of bringing people together for common cause. Fritz Seifert, welcome to Grace Under Pressure. So, Well, it's a pleasure to be with you, John. Thank you. Great. Well, I want to tell folks about you. And um, first of all, you are uh, run a company called FSA, or a consulting firm. You've been doing this for a couple of decades now. And you focus on peak performance, getting teams and individuals there and staying there when you're really good at it. Uh, you learned early in life to be flexible and open to change <laughs> because uh, as a child, you moved a bunch of times with your father's uh, employment and things. You um, spent a lot of time in Connecticut and went back there too. You went to the University of Michigan, played football, um, then went became a, a pro football player and a bunch of other things. You've been doing exciting things, building teams, and you have a brand new book, The Shift from Me, uh, from me to Team. Welcome, Fritz Seifer. So, Great to be with you. Well, I have to tell people, I haven't told you this, but I have known of you ever since I moved to Ann Arbor in 1990. And I was becoming a student of leadership and I met you or saw you someplace and I go, that's a leader. And then later I knew you because you had the bearing about you. You had the, the demeanor, the caring, all of this stuff. You were the total package. Plus you were good at your job. So it's a pleasure for me to connect with you online. So. Well, thank you. Thank you. Those were wonderful so, years and I enjoyed them greatly. Great. Well, you've been consulting for a, a lot of a long time. What led you to write um, this book? So, well, you know, John, when I started this concept of uh, when I went to work for Bo uh, as his his administrative assistant, recruiting coordinator, chief operating officer, you know, in charge of everything off the field, uh, it was fascinating to me that we were looking at height, weight, speed, and GPAs, uh, very objective criteria for recruiting. And yet there was something else that was missing. There was something that, that made the team great. And it, being a systems engineer, uh, I was trying to understand, it, can you systematize success? And in 14 years of studying teams and leaders, uh, I developed this concept, the foundation of greatness. Um, and then I got a chance to take over nine teams of my own at Michigan. And, and coach those coaches. And in three years, we, all nine teams were winning at the highest level in the history of the school. And I thought, my goodness, this actually works. <laughs> Nobody was talking about it. Nobody was, it was, it was, it was something that I thought only I understood. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, a couple of years later, the book Built to Last came out by Collins and Porras, and it said exactly what I thought only I understood. And it was based on six years of research for organizations. I was shocked that this also applied to business, not just athletics. Right. It's about human nature. It's about how we treat each other. I want to stop you right there because I, you are uh, twigged on a topic which I find fascinating and is not talked a lot about. But in your previous role before consulting, you were coaching coaches. What is it like to coach an athletic coach? What do you? What's the process? So, well, the interesting thing is, John, as you have found out, and all of us in the coaching profession found, every one of us is insecure. There is no leader out there that has the security that you think they possess. They all want, and if, they're, if they want to be great, they want to be better tomorrow. And the ones that want to listen and want to take coaching uh, and want to be better tomorrow are the ones that thrive and become sustainably great. Great. And so and, it's, it's, know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a nice audience. Great, good because and that you know I think that's um, very important because they're if they're going to coach they have to be willing to it but maybe not all of them are so receptive to it because of something we call ego. Am I correct? <laughs> well, and, and actually, uh, well, and I will just say this, John. That when, when we got into this coaching profession, I had done a lot of work with the universities and athletic departments around the country. But when I one of the things I've been shocked at is how little interest there is at the professional level or the collegiate level for this kind of 
coaching. Um, athletic directors have big egos. The, 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 the lead coaches have big egos. Um, it's interesting. More at the Division two and Division three level, they're very open to learning and growing. Um, and perhaps there's a little bit of trust in it only because you have to bury your soul a little bit in this business and people don't want to be vulnerable. Very important there. So let's get focus on the book. You have a section called the non-obvious signs that an organization is in trouble. So maybe the blind spots. What, what often do people in place miss about their own organization, Fritz? So. Well, if, if we find it that if we're not having arguments, we're not confronting each other, we're not arguing with each other, uh, pe people tend to think, well, isn't that a great organization if there's no arguments? No, because we all have different perspectives. And the reality is we really want to have four different perspectives on every issue. We don't want everybody lined up on the same side. Uh, and so if there's no arguments, then we have a problem because we're not getting the best of the organization. We're not realizing peak performance. We're not each of us realizing and cap bringing our foundation of greatness into the play to help the organization be all it was meant to be. Because we're not, we're, not, we're not confronting each other. No, and I'm, I'm glad you talked about in, uh, arguments because um, I did something on this years ago. It's called the, <clears throat> I was speaking to an organization and they said, you know, people are just too nice to each other around here. And I go, well, I can work, <laughs> I can name some places and some people might want to switch places. And they said, not really, because it's, as you said, it's conflict avoidance and problems yes. faster. So, right, so, right, right. so that's it. So now getting back to, okay, the non obvious signs, no arguments, those kinds of things. You talk about something we always say, but I don't know if we do a good job. Leaders need to know themselves. So what's the secret to that? Because self-awareness is not always so aware. <laughs> well, one of the things that we'll, we, we talk about is, is that there is a why are we doing what we're doing? And, and at a, we call it at stage three, when we're doing contributing to the benefit of others, what is the joy that comes into our life? What feels right? Um, I think we have to be careful when we're doing it for ourselves, we could be an addict and we could have a problem on what feels right. But when we're doing it for somebody else, let's, what, is, what feels right? Let, get in touch with your personal feelings. Each of us have a foundation of greatness. And when we are in touch with our foundation, we're able to then go out in the world with greater security, more confidence, and lead and not care what the situ what happens because we're just being the best we can be, and that's all we're called to be. Just be the best you can be. And right. when we find that, we feel good about ourselves. Good. Now, I, I like the way you kind of flip this too, that organizations need to know themselves. On the surface, I, I know what those words mean, but how does it play out? What, what, what's really going on if an organization knows itself, uh, Fritz? So. Well, it, it, it is, it's, first of all, it's in its history, it's in its background, it's in its founding, it's in, it, it's in the forefathers of that, that brought it to fruition. Um, there's a reason that the people that are there are there. There is something about that organization that felt right to them. It fit their foundation. And all an organization is, is a collection of individuals' foundations. And the question is, what is that? And we have to ask them, what do they look like? What feels right? What doesn't feel right? How do they perform at peak performance? How do we treat each other? When we're at our best, what do we look like? Well, if that's what we look like at our best, why don't we do that all the time? And that's, I have what, a few, and that's what leadership is all about. <laughs> that's good. I, I'm playing with the idea of uh, leadership uh, or, or the workplace as becoming community. Okay. And community, is, I think that's a, a, a good description for what you talked about. And when you say that, it's not that everybody thinks nor acts alike. And I'm glad you talked about the need for argument <laughs> uh, uh, as a means of exchanging ideas, but um, it's a sense of belonging. Um, how does that play out? Out, Fritz. So, the sense of belonging is that we have a shared core identity on who we are. It's how do we like to work together? Why do we like doing this work? And what difference in the tomorrow do we hope to make? That's that's uh, that's who we are and how we like to work together. Now, the route we take to get there, we can argue about. 
different perspectives can come in on the, what's the best route to take. You know, some of us may say, I see the mountaintop and I, I want to go and the best way is go connect a straight line. And somebody else is going to say, do you know the bridge is out? We need a team of people that can help us see the best route to the destination. But where we're going is clear. How we get there is opened up to argument. Right. Now, you are an expert in teams because you've you know, lived it and, and worked it and managed it and led it for many years. But you've said something interesting, and, and I want to pick on it. You're, it's how we work together. Does that mean we all have to do work alike or do, can we have our own freedom to be divergent or my own style? What's your take on that, Fritz? So. Well, there, this, is, this is where the concept of guiding principles, core values, values, principles comes into play, is how do we, when we're at peak performance, how are we treating each other? What are we doing? How are we conducting ourselves? You know, are we open? open? Are we caring? Are we leading with grace? Do we care <laughs> about each other? Um, it's the, the point to this is, is that it's about how we conduct ourselves. Where we're going is something else, but how do we work together? And um, I'll have to say that in the, uh, it, Collins and Porter said it doesn't really make any difference what your guiding principles are. It's that you have four or five of them. Well, let me share one of the things that we have found is that's not true. <laughs> you have to have trust, caring, uh, trust, honesty, integrity. You have to have caring, grace, compassion, love, whatever you want to call it. You have to have innovation because we have to get better tomorrow. We have to be positive. And those are four. So you can pick a fifth. Um, <laughs> but but well, a fifth might be a growth mindset that, you know, that we're going well, right. to be better tomorrow than we are today. Yeah. And the past, uh, those are the key things that we need. But we right. need to define what are the boundaries for us on those. Now, how tough is it to be positive? You know, uh, we've been through the pandemic. Um, the world was turned upside down. But now there are stresses on how we work. Is it virtual? Is it a hybrid? Is it in person? So what are you telling your the leaders you work with about radiating optimism and, and being positive? What, what do you say, Fritz? Well, I have to say that, that uh, in 2004, I, I encountered the Center for Positive Organizations at the University of Michigan, and I thought, oh, my goodness, these people are doing what we do. Uh, they're doing exactly what we do. And, and the point is that there is research based on what positivity does for us, that seeing the glass half full versus half empty changes our mindset. It changes the chemistry in our brains. We actually function better, faster. Our muscles work better. Things just go better with positivity. And the point is, how do we become grateful? How do we teach people to be grateful? And you've had the clients, John, I've had the clients. Some of them are really hard <laughs> to see the positive side. They are wired for finding things that are wrong. They've been trained to find things that are wrong and they seek and they do find what's wrong. It's difficult, um, <laughs> but life gets better if we can see the positive side. Okay. So let's f flip this over to the softer side. So you'd say that leaders need to show caring. What's a manifestation of caring that is credible? What, what do I'd you say see? The, the, I'd, I'd say the, the motivator in human nature, nature is, is that we be appreciated, that we be valued, that our voice is heard, that, mm -hmm. that we bring something to the table. Uh, none of us are born into the world to see how much we can take. We want to see how much we can give. That is part of our nature. And we want to give it. We want to give it. Leaders just need to understand, let people be all that they can be. And if you've hired the right people and trained them properly, they will give you their best efforts and you'll be, get the reward. If they don't, then you hired the wrong people or you didn't train them properly. And it's your fault. It's not their fault. Care for the. No, go ahead. Yeah, I, I like you say when you say you hire people and to to give their best and enable them to do it. And isn't that so much? And, and so the alternative to that was for decades. So often people were mismanaged by. Well, he's only here for what he can get rather than right. what he can give. So I love the way you turned that around. Yeah. Very positive. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. So. yeah. And it, 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 the idea is, is that people want to be appreciated. 
They want to be acknowledged. They want to, to know how they're doing. They want to be measured. They want to accomplish. They want to get better. It's, of course, John, it, this isn't 100%, but it's more than 80% of the population. Right. Now, because you alluded to the fact and I, that you are a systems engineer by training. Uh, and so, um, and it's interesting how many people are in the field of human development who came from the world of engineering. And it, it's wonderful. So how things work. So um, how do you teach people to learn about how things work uh, organizationally, what, what's what's an insight you share? So, well, it comes down to disciplines that that we have we have to understand what our foundation of greatness is built upon as an individual, but we also have to understand what the organization's foundation of greatness is built upon. What's the core identity? What are the values of the organization? And I like to say that you know, the fit may not be perfect but it's always about the best for the organization because if the organization doesn't thrive, then we're all out of jobs. <laughs> True. And so it's about the organization. It's, a, it's about the team. It's not about me. We have to make the tweak to the organization. And sometimes, as we say, every plant can't thrive in every garden. We have plants in the wrong garden and there's nothing wrong with the plant and there's nothing wrong with the garden. People are just in the wrong place and they need to find a garden where they can thrive. And they will. That is the kind of advice I recently interviewed uh, Alan Mulally, and he says, doesn't use the plant metaphor, but he talks about if pe letting people go. He say, hey, we love you. We've given you every opportunity, but it's maybe not the right fit. Let's find something else. Let's move on. And that's, you know, that, and that's good for the entire organization. So that's part of the culture. So in, and so we have our culture, which is our people values and how we connect. How does that lead to effective well, strategy and execution? the harder things yeah. how do they yeah. complement so well it, it again what do we look like at peak performance that's when we're performing but it's but it's our performing is for today our success is going to be about what we do tomorrow it's not about today it's what are we doing for to make tomorrow more sustainable more successful and the point is is that what we're doing today is moving us toward a vision of a better tomorrow we all see that is deeply meaningful to us now what are the objectives of that vision? How do we measure those objectives? And then what are our initiatives we are putting in place to move toward to achieve those objectives? And so then we go about executing our initiatives, but it's always about a goal that's in alignment with our vision. And that's, what the, and that's why we're doing what we're doing. And you see the resonance in organizations when people feel so comfortable in a company because what we're doing makes so much sense. This is what we said we want to accomplish. And this is what we're doing to accomplish that. It's not like I have no idea what we're doing or why we're doing it. It's connected. And that okay. takes discipline. And that is a system. And is the systems approach enable us to look to the future. And the reason I'm asking that is because work is hard <laughs> and we're always facing challenges. And so when you sit down with an executive and working with them and you talk, start talking future, though, I can sometimes see that, Fritz, I got enough on my plate right now. What are you telling me? Yes. So what's no the response? Question. Well, mm -hmm. it, it is that we need to understand human nature that by doing today, whether it's checking a box that we got a list accomplished, we get it, adrenaline, endorphins, and dopamine from doing that. We don't get anything from planning for a better tomorrow. Except when we have created a better tomorrow, we get the serotonin and oxytocin that makes us feel safe and secure that life is good. We live longer lives with that in our body. And so we have, to, we have to put discipline into the program that weekly, monthly, you will have a meeting that you will not cancel to talk about where are we going and what are we doing to move in that direction. And that's a discipline. One of our clients actually met with Alan Mulally on his last day at Ford, went and met with him to talk to him about just that. How do you put that discipline in place? Because so we introduced them to the concept of what Alan has done, what he did at Ford, and they loved the idea and went and met with him. That's great. That's very powerful. Now, you had an, a special mentor in your life, um, Bo Schembechler. What's, what's a takeaway lesson that 
others can learn from. He was the legendary coach at the University of Michigan football for 20 years and uh, that. So what did you take away from Bo, uh, Fritz? So. Well, I, I guess I have to, what, what you make, make me reflect is that when I left New York City and Arthur Young Company, uh, I was going up the elevator and partners are telling me, you're getting off your career path. You're making a big mistake. You shouldn't leave. You've got a great future here in New York. Um, and about six years after I joined both staff, I'm thinking, boy, did I make a mistake? What am I? And I kept saying to myself, you know, this just feels right. It feels like there's something here that is very special. Uh, Bo is one of those extraordinary leaders in, in the top 1% of, of all leaders uh, who they're just wired. They can't, they don't do the wrong thing based upon what they know. They don't do the wrong thing. They have a compass on and a morality to them on what the right thing to do is. But it was his openness um, his humility, his, his love for people. When you played for him, he was hard on you on the field. But it was only about your performance, not about you, about what you were doing. Not you, what you were doing. And how you can make the team better if you did it differently. Um, but he never attacked you off the field. He, he wanted to know how your parents were doing. He wanted to know how your grades were. He wanted to know how you're doing. Um, he was as caring a person um, as you can find, which is what a fundamental ingredient great leaders must possess. You have to well, care about the people. You mentioned two things in there, and I'm glad you did because you know you're a systems engineer guy, but you work in the world of human development, which is some people say soft and squishy, squishy. But there's two things in there that you mentioned. Um, one is vulnerability, and the other was humility. Um, not everybody in a leadership position is going to buy into, I need to be humble, nor, no, need, nor do I need to be vulnerable. So if I say that to you, Fritz, what's your comeback to a leader who's struggling with that? How do I become more, more open? Whatever. So. Well, this is, this, what we say is there are four components to great leadership. And for our clients, and this is based upon our 21 years of work, the best clients, the best leaders we've worked with, number one, had a growth mindset. They want to be better tomorrow than they are today. They want to be a servant leader. They wanted to be in the world to make other people's lives better than themselves. They're somebody that you can trust. They're open, they're honest, and they're vulnerable. And they are deeply caring people that love the people they work with. Humility is a requirement for all four of those. You can't do any one of those without being a humble person. And so it, the question is, do you want to be a great leader? Now, this is not easy for, for a lot of leaders, but over time and working with them, they can create new habits that actually open themselves up and actually they like themselves better. Interesting you say that. So is there, so for someone who's resilient, or excuse me, not resilient, resistant to showing humility, and it's not because they're a bad person, but I would say because they're maybe uneducated in that sense. So but I would say there's another opportunity, and that would be fear. Do you see that, uh, Fritz? So. Oh, absolutely. It, you know, it, it is, John, it's probably what keeps people from understanding who they really are meant to be is their fear. They're going to, if they reveal who they really are, it's not good enough. And what we like to say is when you really connect with your deepest self and who you are meant to be, it is going to be great. You will love it, you will love yourself, and you will love your life. <laughs> we like to say is that when you try to be somebody else and you make a mistake, there's no ability to retain any learning because there's no place for it to stick. When you honor, trying to honor who you're meant to be and you make a mistake, you can say, ooh, I can see what I did wrong. I'll do it different next time. Great. So now we're going to throw, we have a challenge, we have a question from the audience about critical thinking in the world of AI. <laughs> so yeah. if I were a client and wrestling with AI, it's here and it's only going to be bigger and bigger. Um, what role does discernment or critical thinking play in that? Fritz, I'm throwing you a curveball here. So. Yeah. Well, I, th I think what it, what, where it has something to do with it is, is that we need to create new habits. And if AI can help us see ourselves in a new light that helps us create a better habit, uh, and see us actually doing something that we aren't very good at. And, you know, as the mind can conceive and believe, they can actually go then go and achieve. 
how do we how can we take AI and help people fill the void that they have they may have in their lives in how they conduct themselves and see themselves better and see how they might actually conduct themselves in a more professional better manner especially under pressure especially <laughs> under pressure so yeah the, the good that's now you're getting into a little bit into my world but you're so far you you work with leaders in high pressure situations you've been a leader in high pressure situations so um what do you do to act with grace under pressure? So I'm flipping the table on you, Fritz. <laughs> well, and, 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 and the reality is it's getting to know yourself. Believe in yourself. Know that you have a foundation that can take any hard hit. I like to say, once you know who you are, you can go into any dark room with any dark people and you will come out just fine. <laughs> because you know what you will do and you know what you will not do. You have boundaries a discipline set of boundaries upon which you will perform and others you will not perform. And so the game is in your hands. It's not in their hands. Good point. And I know by dark people, you meant evil intention people. Yes. <laughs> well, and I think, you know, I have to say that uh, I, it, it, it's hard to imagine how many great leaders we've worked with that have these, they're, they're afraid of something out there. They're afraid of something. And the point is, there's nothing out there. Ah, it's the Many monster, the monster yeah. under the bed. Is that? What? Yeah. It, you know, yeah. it's that saber tooth tiger that's lurking around the corner. Well, they aren't here anymore. <laughs> that's okay. Well, now we're going to switch gears. We're, we're going quickly through this, our half hour. And as you know, Fritz, um, I ask every guest a story about grace. Is there a story about grace that you would like to share? So, yes, well, I, you know, I do have one, John, and, you know, and it comes to mind very easily. Um, 21 years ago, when I set out on this venture to create this executive coaching practice, I was having lunch with two to three leaders a week and um, people in the peers in the business and getting advice on, on how I might get started and how I might do this. And somehow you and I got together. I'm sure I called you up and said, would you mind having lunch? And you agreed. And the grace you showed me was exemplary. You treated me like I was the, like you were the lucky one to be with me. And I thought, my goodness, I'm here to learn from you. You're the master. And this, and this is 21 years ago. <laughs> well, well, anyway, so I, I have to say, John, you know, that, that stuck with me and it has stuck with me ever since that, that well, it showed, you well, showed who you were as a person and how you cared about the other person. Wow, it you're very good for you. Yeah. So thank that's, you. That's my that's my example. Yeah. Well, hey, I really appreciate that. So um, how can people find uh, you and Great. the shift from me to team? Well, we have a website. It's uh, team-fsa.com slash book. And you will get all there is on the book and you'll get all the website too. But it's team-fsa.com slash book or Google Fritz University of Michigan and you'll be surprised. <laughs> yeah. I will say about this book, this book is very, um, as your mind works, but it's what we need. It's very concrete. It asks good, I mean, it's good information, good stories. Uh, you're part of your stories in there, but uh, examples and diagrams and questions and things so you can work things out from yourself if you don't have the opportunity to work with you personally. So it's, it's right. well worth its purchase price. So, right. Uh, and yeah. that's and that was the intent is to leave it behind for others to figure it out themselves. It's a journey we all can go on. All right. Fritz, with that, we're going to close out. And I thank you, my friend. So it's my pleasure. Thank you for permitting to be with you.